All right, you can get started whenever you'd like. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Esther Nanny, and my pronouns are she, her. And I'm the director and a faculty member of the School of Disability Studies at Ryerson or X University. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the fifth in a series of six panel discussions that are part of the Sex and the Pandemic series. I'm gonna to start today's um, event with a land acknowledgement. So, We acknowledge that the School of the Disability Studies is in Treaty 13, Treaty 13 territory, a treaty established between, excuse me, the treaty established between the Mississauga of the Credit River and the British Crown. We're surrounded by Treaty 13A, Treaty 20, also known as the Williams Treaty, and Treaty 19. I speak to you today from the city that's currently known as Toronto, and we are situated within the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabeg Nation, nations that was an agreement between them to peacefully share, share the lands and protect the resources around the Great Lakes. As always, land acknowledgements are a moment for us to pause and reflect. And for those of you who are not located in Toronto or located somewhere else, this is an opportunity for you, I invite you to, to also think about um, the territory where you are and the Indigenous peoples and history of the place that you call home. While those of us who are non-Indigenous have come to share this territory and live on this territory in many different ways, we acknowledge that some of us have arrived here through, some of our ancestors and our elders have arrived here through force and have come here involuntarily as a form of displacement or have been brought here through violence. And here we acknowledge particularly those who were brought as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We acknowledge that we are all treaty people and that we are grateful to be working, loving and living in this, on this land. So I want to welcome you again to this fifth of the six part speaker series. Um, I want to particularly invite the audience members who will be part of a conversation of um, many speakers who uh, call our university home. Um, I'm not sure if everyone in the audience has had an opportunity to engage in the past discussions, but they have been a compelling set of conversations between academics, artists, and activists. If you haven't had an opportunity to engage in those conversations in real time, I encourage you to follow up and um, review some of the recordings. I think what you will find is that they offer a wide ranging and critical examination of how sex, sexuality, and intimacy um, uh, are taken up and engaged with in the changing context of current and past pandemics. The conversations that we're about to engage in today are brought to us by the hard work and thoughtful engagement of Dr. Ricky Varghese and his leadership of the Shirk Connections grant that funded this project. Dr. Varghese 
is the Tana Stowe Postdoctoral Fellow in Gender, Disability and Social Justice within the School of Disability Studies. And his work um, complements our ethos of cripping or using the desirable difference and disruption of disability to rethink um, many elements of everyday life, including the uh, many topics that have been brought up through the speaker series, including intimacy, care, health, risk, relationships. Um, I, um, I, I look forward to the vigorous conversation that will take part both as part of the panel and I'm sure with the audience members afterwards. So Ricky, I turn it over to you. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for that note of welcome and for providing the landed notes and Esther and for being here for this speaker series. Uh, before I start, um, I want to uh, provide a, a, a note of uh, apology for a lack of live um ASL interpretation for this event. Um access and accessibility of a, a significant commitment um for our sense of school of disability studies, but unfortunately we were not able to organize uh, an access support team for the event this afternoon. However, um, we do have live captioning um, that is uh, being provided by Angie Lang. And uh, Ali Chenyowski will provide some details about that um, later on in a few moments. Um, we will also have access to uh, a transcript for the event, should anyone want uh, that. So, you can either contact me or Ali, a research assistant for this project, uh, and we will be able to provide a grant for you. Um, so I, I, I want to reiterate uh, and sincerely apologize for a lot of live interpretation for this event. Um, and we will work hard to make sure that there is an access beam for the last panel which was going to happen next month. And with that, I, I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the fifth panel of the section of this pandemic series this afternoon. It's great to be here with you and I'm excited to be doing this series to you. It's been an amazing few months of very rigorous conversations. Um, coming from different directions and different disciplinary um, points of view. And I'm excited to see how the conversation develops and evolves in, in this afternoon's panel. Uh, as Esther mentioned, uh, my name is Lady Louise, uh, and I am the Anastasia Postdoctoral Fellow in Gender, Disability, and Social Justice here at the School of Disability Studies, which is housed in the Faculty of Community Services. My own research lies at the intersection of psychoanalysis, sexuality studies, debt, and disability studies. And I'm particularly interested in relation and in the shifts and changes that have taken place within the history of sex and sexuality. My convention is that the every condition the history of sex that's reimagined, reconstituted, and rewritten anew. I believe this was the case with HIV AIDS, and I sense that COVID-19 as well will have its impact on how we consider intimacy and the landscape of the sexual. It is with these thoughts in mind that I definitely love the series and this panel, and I hope that you will find the ensuing conversation a lot of insightful and pushes us to think 
put that earth in the critical and reckless manner. A bit about how this afternoon will proceed. Um, after the speakers have given their thoughts, I'm permitting, I will initiate a brief discussion between all of us to get us started. After that, we'll open up the floor for questions and comments from the audience. Now we can turn the off stage, they'll review the questions and present them to the panelists. We will now give a few words about how we can ask questions or provide your comments during the discussion portion of the afternoon. Tally? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tally. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the RA for the Sex and the Pandemic series. I'm just going to go over a few access notes, and I will be on screen later just to give a presentation and then to read out questions from the chat. Just a note that if you'd like to see our live captioning, please click the CC button that's on your Zoom menu bar. So there are a few ways for you to participate in today's panel. First, feel free to use the chat box to just chat amongst yourselves, to ask questions directly to panelists, and to maybe ask questions of each other. Um, please note that the chat box is automatically set to send messages only to panelists. If you would like everyone to see remarks, please click the arrow next to the to button and click all panelists and attendees before you send your text. If in the Q&A portion of the panel you would like to speak using audio, please press the raise hand button and we will enable your microphone at the appropriate time. If you would also like your video on to ask your question, please just message me in the chat. Also, Zoom webinars have a question and answer feature. To use this feature, you can press the question and answer button. You can then type your question into the Q&A box and click send. You can also choose to send this question anonymously by checking that box below the typing area. We can reply to these questions live or in text via the window. In addition, if you'd like to use social media to engage with today's panel, please feel free to use the hashtag pandemic sex to connect with each other. We are lucky to have Fan Wu with us today who will be live tweeting today's panel from the Pandemic Sex Twitter account. Thanks, back to you, Ricky. Thanks, Ali. Um, and now without a further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker for today, um, Eto Abdullahi, who most is not all of you should know. Um, it is a colleague of mine at the School of Disability Studies and is an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at, uh, at the university as well. Um, as a critical and disciplinary scholar, she has published on a wide array of topics such as mental health, policing, poverty, HIV AIDS, organizational development, and several other key policy areas at the intersection of Black lives and state interruption. Most notably, it was putting its research on Black and madness and anti Black statism has informed the current debates on fatal police shootings of Black man identified people. So, <laughs> Rather than present a uh, um, conventional uh, paper, um, it will and I will actually engage in a conversation without uh, the ideas of confinement and intimacy. Um, and we will start now. Uh, hi, El. Hi, Ricky. Thank you for having me. No problem. But I guess I want to start out by like, um, you know, start out a conversation by kind of talking about the title a bit around uh, you know, the title of what you were thinking about, talking about it, just confinement and intimacy. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on what you mean when you use the word confinement here and more specifically in relation to the pandemic. Uh, that's a really great question. I think for many people, 
you know, in a lot of ways, the pandemic emerged as this, this time where we consider what happens when some of us um, are not living with those that we are engaged in, like love and like loving relationships or in physical touch or intimacy related relationships. And so um, I think for in many ways, for, you know, um, for some people that um, that the, the pandemic created a context in which they had to think about um, intimacy and confinement differently. And I think that um, to some degree, it also created an interesting conversation around risk and confinement as well and, and um, how that's taken up and to some degree, the ways in which the pandemic um, and being in quarantine has also been made synonymous with notions of confinement, which I think you know we will probably talk about a little bit later, and um, that can be very problematic. So, I think um, I guess essentially, if I if I think about the ways that many people live who also just generally don't have um, access to intimacy, maybe in ways that we can think about, it requires a little bit of troubling. Um, mm -hmm mainly because I think that um, the pandemic for some people or the experience of being in quarantine during COVID-19 um, elicited a kind of life without touch that, that is in this period or in this moment or and maybe confined to this moment that isn't real, um, or sorry, that is very real for people every day outside of the pandemic, right? There, um, there are people, again, who that, um, who this wasn't uh, what confined their notion of intimacy and or uh, laid it out in a kind of way like this. It wasn't those logics. I don't know if that's helpful. No, that makes sense. Um, it definitely, you know, you know, it's true. I mean, confinement is not a new phenomenon for many of us, right? You know, um, that some of us have always experienced the role from, from that position of, having to navigate and negotiate the question of intimacy from the space of being confined. Whether it is that we are confined, whether it is at home or in the form of incarceration, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to kind of understand and almost learn what, how to navigate in, in the, the elements of intimacy in very new ways, to some extent. I suppose I had a question about, you know, you mentioned the risk. Um, how does risk fit into this conversation about confinement and kind of intimacy? Where do you see it kind of appear, or how do you see it appear in this, in this kind of dialogue i think the first thing that comes to mind and you know I'm, I'm saying this in a particular kind of context and i think the first thing that i want to say is um notions of risk are also intimate right um risk also and having relationships um that are intimate again this particular um iteration of the pandemic doesn't um, doesn't contour that. It doesn't. It doesn't um, make this particularly new. But I also think that the idea of um, risk somehow limiting people's access to intimacy or to different ways about thinking about intimacy or that it would curb it, I think, are are also what's interesting for me. But also um, the the idea that. Um, people wouldn't be willing to risk for intimacy and or that we can't talk about what that looks like. I think, you know, you and I've had conversation that, you know, none of the quote unquote dating apps have shut down because of COVID-19, right? Or, um, and, so, and so I think to, to, to think about that again, not only within the context of the pandemic, but again, I think that um, the way that we think about intimacy, the way that we think about risk, the way that we think about how um, how we define what those actual relationships are. And I, I wanna be clear, I mean like in and outside of illness and in and outside of disease and, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, 
conversation about this is uh, fascinating to me because um, I always think about this in relation to questions of accountability and who you're accountable to, whether it's to yourself or to, to intimate others, partners, lovers, friends, uh, family members, enemies. <laughs> you know, uh, at the end of the day, they, I'm, I'm really interested in kind of redirecting the conversation in about what it means to kind of also own your list, you know, and in about what it means to, you know, account for the kinds of lists that we are willing to eat or that we are always already eating. Some of us have not experienced this pandemic from the space of confinement. Some of us have had to go out and look every day. We've had to be in spaces, intimate spaces, and navigate uh, forms of risk just so that we can put food on the table or survive. And um, one has to asked and you know, what it means to think about this itself as being informed by certain kinds of privilege. Uh, who gets the risk of what? And what, what does this mean for different, different people, if that makes sense? So, um, <clears throat> I guess the other question that I you know, move a bit more into this question of the confinement, and another question that kind of comes up for me is, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, people were making out these analogies and metaphors about um, the feeling of being in prison or, you know, the feeling of, uh, uh, being kind of held a prisoner in their own home. And I mean, I, fi I find this analogy uh, incredibly troubling to say the least. <laughs> but I'm wondering why this analogy comes up for people. Like, what is it about this particular moment that seems to um, bring up this analogy. Oh, another, another analogy that comes up is this notion of being at war, you know, being at war, at war with the violence, you know. This is like, this is like a war, uh, a period of war, you know, or a period of scarcity. And I'm curious about what that means, you know, why these kinds of very specific uh, metaphors or analogies are kind of being mobilized in this moment. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Those are really good questions, Ricky. Those are like three questions in one. Um, <laughs> so I think maybe first to begin with um, the reference around um, feeling imprisoned or um, incarcerated, I think that, you know, people are entitled to define however they feel as they desire, but to correlate the life of a person who's in captivity, um, the life of a person who cannot um, make some of the very auton autonomous decisions that uh, we can in this space. And, you know, one of those really simple things is um, we can, you know, we can decide if we want to go for a walk at a particular time of the day or not we can decide um if we want to for some of us to be able to phone our kin or phone our um lover phone our community at any time um in some ways we have internet access we have facetime we have right um within you know the, the canadian penal system there you don't you get a half an hour you know visit if you're if you're lucky um, per week with a family member. And so I think for me, a key word is captivity. Mm -hmm. um, captivity is really, really important to consider. And I also think the other piece is, what is it about the experience that, um, what is it about the experience of 
the pandemic and feeling uh, like your mobility is limited, which is, I think, something that we can, a correlation that we can make to some degree. Um, but what is it that we're trying to express by that? What is it that we're trying to what is it that we're trying to share about that experience? Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that another consideration as well is not just in, in relationship to being incarcerated, but um, I think also the references to um, feeling like one is incarcerated in their own body and um, and, and not in in general, but specifically um, related to the pandemic. And so um, I, I, I think that it's 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 an a, a very unfair correlation and example to make. And again, I think the piece is to say, what is it that people want to identify? Is it that lack of mobility? Is it a precarity? Is it um, is it feeling constrained? Right? Um, you know, words have meanings, and um, captivity is real. Right? Um, and access is real and immobility is real as is the feelings that some some people are expressing but I think that there's an ethic and genuineness that we require when we're trying to make these kinds of um, uh, connections and in terms of you know the language around um, war and and military and I think that uh, quite clearly um, we, one, so that's not a new rhetoric within the Canadian um, context, obviously, when we when we saw SARS and um, other, you know, other health crises, um, the nation tends to draw on these kinds of ideas around um, safety and health. And if we think about, you know, where I'm located in Ontario, um, we also saw the deployment of like the Medical Act uh, for the first time in, in a long time. Um, we've also seen, um, you know, comments from our, our, our premier uh, who's made references about war, about defending the front lines, um, but then we have, we don't have discussions about then who are those quote unquote soldiers, right? And then who are the people that are dying on these battlegrounds if that is what, how it is that we're defining this, which quite frankly, I do think it's a problematic definition and I think it's important to say that. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, there's 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 never been um, you know uh, there's always been a connection, sorry, between you know military masculinization, state policy, um, and the way that that's weaponized um, against individuals. But ultimately, what that means for the bottom line is that it plays out at the practical level. It plays out at the policy level. Um, and lastly, around your Pete, the comment about um, people not having experienced uh, the pandemic in the same way in terms of their limited mobilities, uh, we see it. We see it um, in, in front of hospitals, we see it um, in streets, we see it in terms of the increase of, um, you know, the gatherings of like vehement white supremacist violence um, throughout. And so absolutely it is um, the, those, those mobilities are not limited in the same way. Um, and neither are then the consequences that come as a result of those, um, those different responses to mobility and immobility, which again are very much so connected to the state. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I really appreciate what you, what you said about captivity because it's, it's, a, it's a word that I haven't actually heard be, be used in relation to the pandemic, and I, 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 you know, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about kind of what you mean by that. Because, and I, I, I ask this question because when I hear the word captivity, I also, there's another word that kind of comes up for me, which is being, this is, this is, this is um, abandonment. <laughs> Um, and what it means to be abandoned or left behind, and specifically being abandoned and left behind by, by a state, yeah, to some extent. But especially if you are a body that is marginalized historically or contemporaneously, and also, uh, you, you know, uh, kind of left to have to kind of fend for yourself. Um, and it's the reason why that word comes up for me when I hear the word captivity is that it's, it's, 
To me, it is both is happening at the same time on the side of industry that you are both um, experiencing that kind of captivity and the inability or lack of mobility or lack of capacity to move, but you're also not being um, empowered by the state or supported by the state in a way that allows for us to live comfortable, healthy, safe lives. And so I was wondering if you had something to say about that, but also just talk a bit more about captivity um, and, and kind of expand on that concept a bit more, that idea a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe for me, the first thing is that I don't think that the state's um, real goal is in our well being, uh, whether that is, again, even outside of the notion of this particular pandemic, if we think about. Um, you know, the idea of the state's investment in wellness. Um, it's certainly, it's not invested in, it's invested in the wellness of particular types of populations and so forth. And in fact, it's dependent on um, the ill health of particular populations in order to keep uh, certain state, uh, you know, state health systems functioning. And I, and I guess the first thing I think about certainly is, you know, what's happening in here in Ontario, but certainly what's happening in Calgary. And, you know, earlier our colleague was talking about what's happening in Utah, who maybe, I don't know if he'll speak to that later, but um, I think um, what I, the first thing again, that just comes to mind is certainly just around um, the production for me, I think about the production of like, um, the labor to, to keep up the appearance, appearance that the state is, is um, invested in, in our health and our health care. Um, so I'll stick a pin in that, but in, to come back to the, the question around uh, captivity and um, thinking through sort of what that, what that means, I, I think Ricky, like you pose really good questions around um, how these things happen simultaneously, um, and also how they happen not only in relation to the state, but in relation to who gets left behind. Um, and I think, you know, if we take lessons from um, disabled communities, if we take lessons from crip communities, if we take lessons from um, mad communities, what we know is that the way that the state is responding to these issues isn't new because these are experiences that are well known to particular kinds of populations, right? Um, and so that's, for me, the other part around um, captivity is maybe that uh, in making some of these distinctions are in what ways have we revealed um, sort of the continuum of maybe captivities, the continuum of experiences um, in relation to how, like, you know, who's who's getting responded to for um, COVID nineteen. So I don't know if that answers your question at all, but no, that definitely does. It's you know, I, I, I I I of the pandemic. Um, uh, I was thinking about how. And I've heard you know, my colleagues at the School of Dis you know, people at the School of Disability Studies and others talking about how there are so many lessons on how to live in the context of the pandemic that can come from communities that have lived with disability, people with disabilities. I mean, in the sense that we know in many ways how to state has an impact on our bodies, our uh, everyday lives, our capacity to move across space if, if we are even allowed to, and how our bodies are surveilled to some extent. And there are lots and lots of lessons there that I think in many ways there were only probably at the end uh, of having to scratch the surface of learning what those lessons are. Um, but the one thing that I, I suppose, and this is probably my last question, or my last, last kind of observation, is I, I was wondering how you understood the question of surveillance 
in this moment. Um, and I, I asked that question about surveillance precisely as it relates to confinement. Um, because, you know, this, one of the things about this pandemic and that any other pandemic or epidemic in the past is that they're all watching each other experiences from our phones, if they're lucky enough to have technology or from our social media accounts. It is, it's a kind of perpetual um, mediation that they're all kind of having to be witness to or having that we are constantly exposed to. And on the one hand, there are interesting forms of community that have come up from, come out of that or emerged from that. But on the other hand, it's also been a way in which they've all been kind of surveilling each other around uh, forms of behavior and the kinds of risks that they all in, in our individual or private lives. So I was wondering if you talk, if you had any thoughts about the question of surveillance in this moment uh, as, as it relates to confinement. Yeah, um, that's a, another really great question. I think, you know, one of the really quick ties that I just want to make is in relation to um, intimacies, confinement and surveillance, particularly during the pandemic. And um, I know earlier you talked about um, the experience of imprisonment. So I, I want to just go back to that really quickly and say that um, in terms of surveillance and risk and intimacy, like here in um, here on Turtle Island, particularly in Ontario, um, you know, Correctional Services Canada does not, it is illegal to have intimate relationships within uh, these institutions, right? Like if you, you there are severe consequences, obviously both um, from like they're illegal, but also from your the folks that live there. And so when I even think about the idea of surveillance and what that looks like um, for those of us who are um, not incarcerated, uh, there's no likelihood that you know we would be arrested or that our you know we would we would be sent to the hole or, or any of these kinds of things, for example, if we were caught engaging, um, in intimacies or um, private intimacies within during the pandemic. So I think that's something that I just really want to make clear to people is that um, intimacies also cause confinement, right? Intimacies also incarcerate, and we may not think about that within our particular context, but they do in other um, in other contexts, particularly um, for those that are incarcerated again. And I think. Um, the other piece is, again, just in terms of, you know, the idea of the pandemic and our, I believe that we're always collectively engaged in systems of surveillance, you know, no doubt. Um, mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that the pandemic has done is it's provided people other excuses to further surveil particular populations. Um, you know, it's, it's become an invitation to surveil Black people, it's become an invitation to surveil um, people who are read as not being well. Um, you know, we started to normalize particular kinds of, you know, disclosures about our health, whether you cough in an elevator, but you're still wearing a mask. And, um, and, and yet again, like I think those are also things that people who are living with disabilities, people that are mad, um, you know, et cetera, have always experienced on top of, again, like I said, you know, Black people, so forth. So I think I don't want to make fantastic this particular experience of surveillance, but what I do want to say is to think about how, how have these ideas created invitations to visit, you know, violence on people anew, right, in the name of um, social care, in the name of social responsibility, in the name of, um, you know, even trying to care about your neighbor, right? Um, so not necessarily entering it as, for me, as something different, but to think about, well, how does this play out? What does this look like in, in the lives of people? Um, yeah, I think, I think that would be it. And also, I think um, the last thing I'm going to say is, with, within all of these discussions to keep in mind um, the autonomy of people, right? Yeah. Ultimately, 
Uh, and I think that's the really difficult thing is to really think about like, um, how can I respect people's bodily autonomies? How can I respect people's, um, yeah, I think I'm, I, I think I'll leave it there. Like, what can that look like? And um, what are the challenges that I have with, with that? What are the challenges that I'm thinking around about my own feeling incarcerated, feeling confined, feeling less mobile? Like, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. Um, and to consider, to consider what that is. For sure. I just want to end you for this conversation with, um, it's uh, left me and I'm sure many of the audience members with lots of interest think about and consider and I'm hoping we can continue the conversation uh, you know, when you know, it's us in person, but I, I just want to thank you for you know, being here and being part of this. Um, and now I will move on to introducing the next speak- set of speakers for this event. Um, our next set of speakers are Maldi Chen uh, and Eric Janowski. Uh, Maldi is an Associate Professor of uh, Professional Communication at Ryerson University. They are the author of Select Very Well, HIV Concepts, Disability, and Clear Lens Narratives of Hair, which was published by Rutgers University Press in Lenny Lenny. Um, it's book investigates HIV activism past and present through the lens of caregiving. Since work draws on homo archives and plans literature to prison abolition and defunding the police. Ali uh, received her master's in neuroscience from the Ill University in 2016. They currently work for the School of Disability Studies at Ryerson in multiple roles, primarily as access support. They are a Swiss army knife of academic needs for filming, and I, I personally must add, it's basically my right and left hand person when it came to pulling this series together. Um, I quite, quite literally couldn't have done this without them. Um, Marty and Ali's presentation is titled Hot for Zoom, Cruising for Access Intimacy Across Pandemics. Hi, everyone. Um, first off, I want to thank Ricky for that very kind introduction. It's been a true pleasure to work with you over this project and to get to listen to and think with all the incredible scholars and activists. Oh, I'm so blown out here. <laughs> Sorry. I'm mean, in a distance perspective. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, here's also Marty, who's sitting here with me. And um, my girlfriend, Morgan, is somewhere in the background. And we all collaborated on this presentation together. Um, so today, I'm going to take you through a small arts-based presentation that was made in collaboration with Marty Fink and Morgan C. When Marty was invited to be a part of this series, they were unsure how they could participate because they are unable to use Zoom. I've been Marty's longtime friend slash collaborator. I got to work with them on their fantastic book, Forget Burial. Um, And so we decided to work together on a presentation that centers our queer relationship in an examination of digital technologies that promise intimacy for many in the pandemic mainly Zoom and also Grindr. Um, My girlfriend, Morgan C, is an incredible artist and PowerPoint genius. That's her. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And she kindly volunteered to create our slides. Um, We gave her design ideas and she, of course, came back to us with the most beautiful slide deck I've ever seen. So uh, just give me a second, I'm gonna... Sure. Okay. Okay. So um, we are looking at a phone screen. There is a grinder icon inverted and wearing a mask. Below is the title of our presentation hot for Zoom, cruising for access intimacy across pandemics. All right. 
So after entering the Grinder app, we see multiple portraits of people who are nearby. Marty, Tally, and Morgan are located on top. After clicking on Marty's profile, their picture fills the screen. Um, they are a white, queer, trans person with curly brown hair and a beard. Their blue eyes look directly at the camera and they appear to be shirtless. In fact, they are. Um, beautiful greenery and florals are in the background. We should click on Marty's photo. I think we're intrigued. Text pops up. Marty, 39. Gender, trans, pronouns, they, them. Position versus bottom. Looking for right now. Bio. In January 2020, just before the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, Marty sustained a traumatic brain injury, a concussion. They were almost six months into taking testosterone and were seeking entrance into the exciting world of fag sex, which they couldn't figure out how to do without being able to use their screens or leave their house due to head injury. Then COVID happened. Let's swipe to see the next person. Oh, <laughs> it's me. A picture of Tally fills the screen. They are a white, fat, queer, trans person with long golden hair and makeup. They have earbuds in and are against a dark background. I think we should find out more about them as well. <laughs> we click on their portrait and text pops up. Tally, 36. Gender, non-binary, pronouns, they, them. Position, verse, talk. Looking for chat only. Bio. Tally isn't actually on Grinder at all, but as someone who professionally negotiates access barriers at X University and a longtime RA to Marty, they seemed an ideal collaborator to answer Marty's question of how to survive and thrive in COVID-19 when screens and Zoom present an access barrier not just to technology, but to sex. All right, let's click and see the next person. Wow, a picture of Morgan fills the screen. She is a white trans woman with pink cheeks and red hair. She is wearing her polycorn costume, which a large, with a large pink fuzzy heart on her chest and five soft looking horns on her head. She is standing in a green forest. What a babe. I wonder what she's about. So we'll click on her portrait and then text pops up. Morgan, 37. Gender, trans. Pronouns, she, her. Position, PowerPoint, service bottom. Looking for graphic arts opportunities. Bio, I had a grinder profile and it got lots of attention, but I was scared to meet up. This photo is of me 10 years ago. But even if I posted photos from last week, I worry about how people would react when they compare my cute pics to my dysphoric trans body. Lol. Anyway, pay, to, pay me to make stuff, morgancy.com. Okay, let's head back to our main screen and see who else is around. Oh, um, it looks like we have a message. Ugh. There are always so many mobile ads on these apps. This one appears to be like many of those save the fish ads that are everywhere, except here we have to save sex. Marty is on their phone in their underwear and separated from like a grinder stud by a hockey stick barrier. <laughs> Above the grinder stud is Zoom with a hockey stick barrier that we need to remove first. But if we're not careful, we will move the barrier that lets hockey pucks fall on Marty's head, giving them a concussion. And then the Zoom logo turns into a horny minotaur? What? <laughs> okay, well, let's get out of here, maybe. Okay, so it looks like we have a few messages in our inbox. It seems that someone named Access Zoom has sent us a photo. 
Let's click on our portrait. A photo of a muscled blue torso fills our screen. There is a Zoom logo tattoo on their chest and they are wearing tight, revealing white underwear. There appears to be mushroom huts in the background. <laughs> Let's take a closer look at their profile. Access Zoom, 27. Gender, I'm a man. Lol, is this a joke? This is something that Marty actually saw on Grindr when they prefer, they probably that person prefers they, he, him pronouns. So. Um, position top, looking for networking, friends, chat only, relationships, dates. Bio, for many, including some of you on this call, Zoom is a tool that connects people sexually and socially, a tool through which many can learn and teach and fuck and talk. Okay, let's look at what their photo message is. Okay. <laughs> So they sent us a photo of a fleshy mushroom emerging from the ground. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's say hey to them. And they write back, hi, cutie, what's up? We say, how's it going? He says, doing good, horny AF. We say, haha, same. He says, any more pics? We say, you looking, what are you into? He says, oh, just chatting for now because pandemic. Want a video? We say, oh, I have a concussion, so I can't video. He says, can I see more of you? We say, for me, Zoom is the antithesis of connection. It shuts down the possibility of pretty much any other way of connecting. Its corporate nature also monetizes our connections and creates one mediated way of connecting at the expense of all others, which I think is pretty interesting. They say, huh? <laughs> all right, let's get out of here. Get back. I feel like, we had a conversation with Tally. Let's see what they say. Okay, so this is a conversation from a while ago. They sent us an illustration of like two men kissing. We said, nice, who's that? They said, Captain Jack and the doctor. And we said, Doctor Who? And they said, haha, yeah. And we said, what? And then they responded with like a tongue out emoji and T to IL. Let's try to get this going again. We say, hey. They reply back, hey. We say, how's it going? They said, great, just wrote some fan fiction. We say, hi. Oh man, they sent us a link. We should probably click on that. Okay, so this is Tally's friend fan fiction. Tally rolls over on their back, lying on their Britney Spears smash the patriarchy beach towel. It's their absolute favorite. Green with a picture of Britney Spears circa 2007, shaved head, angry, raising an umbrella against an invisible paparazzi. They lay still for a minute, adjusting their dark sunglasses against the glorious rays of the sun and then sit up cross-legged, arms stretched back. It is just Morgan, Marty, and them right now. The rest of their friends off to get alcoholic popsicles from the very hot topless lady with the cooler on the main part of the beach. Every time Marty and them hang out, the first order of business is to fetch about all the ways their bodies and mind are totally fucked at the moment. There is typically a good mix, variations on a theme, Tally can't breathe well right now. It's probably an impending heart attack, i.e. anxiety plus a lifelong fat phobic warning against heart disease. Marty's back hurts and the swimming pools are closed, i.e. their chronic pain is flaring up because swimming is the only thing that alleviates it. Morgan is exhausted, i.e. we forgot to bring some Mountain Dews to the beach. Tally says, 
I guess I feel like Zoom has been really good for some disabled people still. Tally doesn't really want to defend Zoom, but it feels important to acknowledge that lots of disabled people have actually found some benefit to video chats in remote life. But objectively, it's kind of a shitty thing to say to someone who literally can't use it because of the concussion. Marty, though, is super kind and responds. What do you mean? Well, it's just for some disabled people during and also before and like after the pandemic, if there is an after, video chatting has been pretty integral to their lives. I wonder how people have been cripping Zoom, using it in unintended ways. I guess I'm thinking about the disability filibuster, a multi-day virtual protest organized by disability activists against Bill C-7, the expansion of medical assistance in dying. Marty replies, in between bites of salami and sips of their limoncello la coy. But for me, I can't use Zoom, and that means I can't work, I can't connect, and everything else is canceled, Tally replies. Yeah, I don't know how people are queer and trans on Zoom. It's so weird to just be able to put your pronouns on your face, like you're wearing a pronoun sticker at your new nonprofit job. Like, is it easier to be perceived as trans on Zoom? I saw a TikTok the other day that said that everyone has become non-binary lesbians over the pandemic. Marty laughs. Oh my God, send that to me. Tally will scour their likes later for the TikTok and send it to Marty along with another one that talks about how the unfair beauty standard for non-binary Jews is emaciated Jesus on the cross. I know, right? But for me, like my gender doesn't really make any sense to me unless I'm around other queer and trans people. Like right now, when I see our faggy friends and their thongs, they all bought from the same place but different colors, or the young bear over there who is making out their punk boyfriend behind the log. And like you and Morgan here on the beach, I feel gender kinship. But if people only can see and connect to me on Zoom, they just get my floating head and the they them label. Sometimes it is dissociating. Also, I don't think people can tell how fat I am or like what any of our bodies look like. Don't we all have enough ang angst around being disembodied? Marty takes no time at all to respond. True Gemini. Yeah, and on Grindr, I can put that I'm trans and my pronouns, but Grindr still sorts and markets me through binary genders. Everyone has to perform a cis masculinity to get laid too. It's such a relief when I meet up with someone and they're femme. What a delight. Morgan turns to face them both lowers her red heart sunglasses and gives a big cheesy grin. Someone say femme, true Leo. Okay, that was neat, I guess. Let's go back to the inbox. Looks like we have something here from someone named Universal Design. Let's check them out. Okay, so we have a full photo of someone's crotch on the screen. Um, they seem to be wearing a jock strap that says Universal D on it. It appears to also be a stock photo. Oh God, I wonder what their profile is like. Universal design, 54. Gender, cis man. Position, versatile. Looking for, blank. Meet at, my place, your place, bar, cafe, bio. Zoom, like Grindr, presents itself as a platform that creates universal access for all during the pandemic. This is also a fantasy of many public offline spaces, that there is a way to have architecture adapt to the needs of every potential user. Okay, let's go back to our photos. Um, a picture fills our screen. Its orientation is flipped the wrong way for our phone. It appears to be a stock photo of people looking at security cameras of an apartment on a tablet. Disability theorist Amy Hamray 
brings queer and trans studies to their investigation of universal design. A stock illustration fills our screen. It is multiple people sitting around a table. One of them is visibly disabled, a wheelchair user. They are being directed to look at a large screen with a zoom grid of other people. Amy Henry looks at ongoing histories of racial, of racial segregation in US cities in which so-called universally accessible buildings are located. Now we see another stock photo of a bright office with colorful pink lights and a fancy gamer chair. The monitor on their desk has the same illustrated zoom grid of people. Hamre shows us how access is thwarted by the larger white supremacist capitalist systems and structures in which design occurs. We see another stock photo of a bright white office. There is a gay poster on the wall. The computer monitor shows the same zoom grid, but like what's in the window? It looks like a coil of rope or something. Oh my God, it's like another ad. This one is called the Universal Design Puzzler and it has a cursor trying to entangle color rope. There's also an illustrated picture of Marty looking on their phone, being confused and dizzy. Universal Design. Not so universal at all, especially when created for capitalist profit as our Zoom and Grinder. Rena Bivin's scholarship on software platforms shows us how to notice when platforms are pretending to be trans and otherwise inclusive. Facebook and Tinder, for instance, provide users with many gender options. Yet, the platforms still force users into binary categories when they first sign up for the software. And this is as a way to collect and sell users' data. These platforms, for marketing reasons, are effectively eliminating the potential spectrum of gender options they claim to offer. What happens in a pandemic when we rely on this software to get sex? Can we make it more inclusive actually? Or can we at least use it differently than is designed? Okay, so now we're actually in the chat with Universal Design. Looks like they've messaged us for a bunch. Two days, a day ago, they said, hey, stud. Then earlier today, they said, hey, stud. Hey, stud, in all caps. And now they're messaging us again. Hey, stud, what's up? Stud, you there? You horny? Fine, don't reply to me. You're lost, loser. And then there's just like a bunch of transphobic nonsense. Okay, let's get out of here. Okay, so we're back in our grid and it looks like we have a new profile to look at, someone called Biomedicine. A photo fills our screen of two light-skinned people. One appears to look like a doctor and is holding a thermometer in the other person's mouth. Who seems to be enjoying that. Okay, let's see this person's details. Um, biomedicine with a syringe, 35. Gender, non-conforming. Position, top. Sexual health, negative. On prep, last tested September 2021. Looking for right now. Bio, double vaxxed into all types of guys. No time for racism, transphobia. No mask for mask crap. You host, don't waste my time. As Jules Gill Peterson argues in their work on trans children, biomedicine actually uses gender variance to reinforce binary categories of sex. Like this software itself, the choices give the user the illusion of gender freedom, while still measuring big data in a way that is only about binary sex. So is the freedom to fuck in this pandemic contingent on playing into this software's ideas of what kind of white supremacist masculinities are sexually desirable and whether or not we can conform to them? What does it mean to transition in, in a pandemic on Grindr? Can one understand sexuality and desirability outside of this software? 
when IRL modes of connecting and culture are all canceled? Did you really transition if no one can see you except on Zoom? And what if you are too concussed to Zoom even right now? Okay, I'm not interested in looking at this person anymore. Let's get out of here. Um, I feel like there was like a new message from Tally. Maybe we can see what's there. Oh, earlier they just said totally in response to hot. Let's maybe see if we can get this going. We ask, what are you looking for on here? They say, not sure yet, just chatting for now, I guess. That's it, that's our presentation. Thanks a lot, Dallas. Fun. Um, Innovative uh, and uh, and new kind of presentation. It was so um, you know so providing that kind of quickly of technology it was very technologically astute <laughs> and savvy. Uh, so I just want to thank you and uh, Maldi and Molden for this uh, this presentation. And now we're gonna move on to our final. Um, Speakers for this afternoon. Uh, Sorry, I'm just having trouble unsharing my screen. Just one sec. Oh, like the Zoom menu disappeared. Oh, there it is. Hey, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I want to introduce our final speaker for this afternoon, uh, Darius Most, who is logging on all the way from Utah. Um, Darius is Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies in the School for Cultural and Social Transformation at the University of Utah, co-editor of Frontiers, a Journal of Women's Studies. Both is the author of Evidence of Being, the Black Bit Cultural Renaissance and the Politics of Violence, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2019. Related research on Black queer literatures and cultures, Black masculinities, and HIV AIDS has been published in a range of scholarly journals and edited collections. His research has been supported by several prestigious fellowships, most recently, the WED Du Bois Institute Fellowship at Harvard University and the Visiting Scholars Fellowship at the at the uh, Center for American Studies at the British Library. Our boss's current book project is an interdisciplinary study of queer visual cultures across the Anglophone Black diaspora from the 1970s to the present. Um, his thought is titled Reading Insects Black Queer Literature in the Time of HIV AIDS. There it is. Um, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this invitation, um, Ricky, and, and thanks to everyone um, for being here. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, actually. Um, and I also um, am sort of happy to be a part, not sort of, I'm happy to be a part of this uh, series um, with so many great um, panelists, um, people I admire. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started if I can make this thing work. Can folks see my um, screen? Okay. We cannot right now. Oh, okay. Try it again. How about that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so in, in 2001, uh, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released the results of its young men study, suggesting that one in seven Black men uh, will be infected with HIV each year, three in 10 already have HIV, and virtually none of them know they have it. In the wake of the study, the New York State Black Gay Network, in collaboration with AIDS Project Los Angeles, published the anthology Think Again in 2003 
edited by the late Trinidadian-born Black LGBTQ rights activist and creative writer Colin Robinson and Black gay creative writer and, and archivist Stephen G. Fullwood. And I should note, based on the, re the reception and success of this, uh, there were three subsequent volumes published across the first uh, decade of the 21st century. So the volume includes visual art, poetry, and short fiction, but it mostly comprised um, is mostly comprised of personal essays by Black queer intellectuals, many of whom would go on to make significant interventions in the academic fields of African American literary studies and Black queer studies. Focusing on personal essays by Black queer intellectuals Charles Stevens and Vincent Woodard, this presentation demonstrates how Black queer literature challenges the objective language of social service and state bureaucracies that claim to know the truth about Black queer life and sex. In so doing, I demonstrate how creativity and the imagination act as material forces that produce alternative orders of knowledge about Black queer sex in the time of HIV AIDS. During the early era of the AIDS pandemic, lesbian and gay activists used direct action activism, community building, and creative practice to raise public consciousness and to get drugs into bodies. By the first decade of the 21st century, however, HIV AIDS had shifted in terms of public awareness and had edged towards the mainstream of health policy. Coinciding with this shift, many of the radical aspects of the earlier AIDS response had given way to a professionalized HIV AIDS service industry. This shift to more biomedical, legislative, and policy-based approaches caused many HIV AIDS advocacy organizations to abandon complex understandings of identity for more essentializing approaches. In their introduction to Think Again, Robinson and APLA Education Director George Ayala named the limited vision of HIV advocates as one of their motivations for creating the anthology. They express, express their regret about how HIV advocacy work had been reduced to case finding and condom distribution. The 21st century turn to treatment and prevention did not account for the pathological narratives attached to Black sexuality. Since the 19th century, public health discourses have constructed Black people as inherently different or behaving differently, and public health discourses of HIV AIDS are no exception. The overdetermination of Blackness within colonial modernity has marked the Black AIDS epidemic as the natural outcome of Black sexual difference, and Black health crises and premature death as normative and unremarkable. The association of HIV AIDS with narratives of racial and sexual deviance prompted many Black people to disavow the disproportionate effects of HIV AIDS on their communities and to distance themselves from the marginal members of the community who were dying of AIDS. Embracing the, the impact of HIV AIDS on Black communities risks jeopardizing Black struggles for political inclusion as liberal human subjects. Contrary to Black political investments in liberal humanism, the Black queer intellectuals of Think Again recognized the necessity of Black sexual deviance to dominant orders of knowledge. In his contribution to the volume, Kevin Quashie describes the social meanings of sex that position Black queer sexuality as excessive, um, sorry, as excessive, quote, too often in our social culture, sex is either not articulated relegated to that which must be, must be hushed, kept as only private, as the body's most profound but also most intimate act. Or when sex is public, it is simplified, rendered as the erotic body out of control and singularly motivated. By those measures, sex has no legitimate public face and is not in any way a sophisticated location of self. Black queer bodies have been defined by even as the, they confound these social meanings. Public health interventions have redefined Black queer bodies as public bodies. Black queer sexual practices are subject to state surveillance and sexual intimacy becomes a form of state intimacy. The young men's study perpetuates notions of the Black queer body as an erotic body out of control. It names down low black men, men who have sex with men, but who do not identify as gay, as the special risk and threat to black communities 
Given the rise of HIV among Black heterosexual women, this media construction labels Black queer men as a public health risk with little to no attention to the social meanings and conditions that shape their sexual practices. Narratives of Black racial and sexual devious, deviance deem these bodies as duplicitous, and their sexual practices only come into public consciousness as a threat to the health of the national body. The study also pretends that virtually no Black queer men know their status, thereby denying them any claims to sexual agency and disallowing their claims to sexual subjectivity as a sophisticated location of self. Conversely, the social meanings attributed to Black queer communities justifies and legitimates state intervention. It is in this political and social climate that NYSBGN and APLA began, began creating and promoting, quote, publications, research, and other activities that challenge consciousness, expand knowledge, and celebrate culture of Black men who practice same-sex desire. The intellectuals included in Think Again undermine the ontological foundations and epistemic regimes on which public health discourses rest. Rather than subscribe to models of behavioral change, treatment, and prevention that depend on deficit models of Black sexual cultures measured against dominant conceptions of human sexuality, the literature and visual art included in the volume emerged from creative, embodied ways of knowing Black for sex. Through sexual expressivity, the journal contributors not only critique current orders of knowledge that incorporate Blackness to firm up liberal conceptions of the human, but they also propose alternative conceptions of the human that account for Black queer embodiment. In his landmark personal essay, Brother to Brother, Words from the Heart, Joseph Beam discusses how under white supremacy, capitalism, and heteronormativity, Black gay men were never meant to be together. Quote, not as father and son, brother to brother, and certainly not as lovers. Beam's early call for Black male community building was an attempt to transgress the dictates of Black masculinity that would prohibit intimacy between Black men. But 15 years later, the professionalization of AIDS advocacy ruptured the bonds that Beam viewed as a vital force for Black gay community building. Carl Stevens' essay, Loving on a Minefield, speaks to these ruptures, showing how public health interventions encourage Black gay men to see every sexual encounter as risky and every sex partner as a potential threat. Stevens, founder of the Black Gay Activist or Organization Counter Narrative Project and co-editor with Fullwood of the landmark volume, Black Gay Genius Answering Joseph Beam's Call, begins the essay by describing an HIV outreach effort that was advertised as a workshop on Black gay male relationships, identity, and community. Stevens usually avoids these kinds of events because he, quote, leaves not wanting to fuck anymore. The events not only label HIV people as scapegoats for the prevalence of HIV in Black queer communities, but they also encourage HIV negative people to quote, consider everyone they fuck a predator, a walking disease. Under the guise of a relationship workshop, public health discourses sort Black queer bodies into categories of positive and negative and position these bodies in an antagonistic relationship these bodies are turned into data, statistics, and objects of study. And it is assumed that one of the five or six at the workshop, out of the five of the six at the workshop, two already have HIV, at least one attendee will become HIV positive and others may have it and not know it. Questions about condom usage, warnings about HIV positive sexual partners and encouragement to practice safer sex are aimed at behavioral change. But as Stevens points out, these approaches redefine Black queer sexuality as a negotiation of risk and safety. Quote, pleasure is never thrown into the equation. Stevens describes public health's categorization of Black queer bodies through militaristic metaphors. Quote, Hell, one would think we were at war with each other, 
But then again, they always have been more comfortable with us, with us being at war with each other than with being with, uh, with them. Uh, the, wars of, the war of AIDS is fought on my body. Stevens's description of AIDS through militaristic metaphors signifies on the work of Essex Hemphill, who in the poem Occupied Territories describes the Black same-sex desiring body as a militarized zone. Taken together, Hemphill and Stevens suggest how state-based approaches to sexual health have produced Black queer bodies as risky bodies that must be controlled, contained, and prevented from spreading disease to other communities as well as their own. Consequently, the potential of touch, pleasure, and desire to produce better health outcomes in Black queer communities is denied and disavowed. Stevens's insights reveal how Black queer men's war with each other directs attention away from the state's role in the prevalence of HIV in Black communities. Adam Geary contends that state violence accounts for a significant portion of the disease prevalence in Black communities. He asserts that the violent intimacy of the state through racist policies like segregation and mass incarceration yield negative health outcomes in Black communities. The racist state creates the sociobiological conditions for disease to take hold. Yet, its responsibility for ill health in Black communities has been alighted by public health focus on the so-called risk behaviors of individual Black people or the deviance of Black culture. Public health practitioners' cultivation of fear and antagonism within Black queer communities can prevent these communities from mobilizing against the structural inequalities that have made them vulnerable to HIV AIDS in the first place. The fear-based messaging of HIV education brings Stevens to an epiphany, quote, do not fear the touch of your brother. It might be his touch that saves you, a refrain he returns to throughout the essay. Stevens's use of the vernacular term brother harkens back to Beam's essay, Brother to Brother, and suggests that the touch to which Stevens refers exceeds the genitally focused definitions of sex that remain hegemonic in this era of the history of sexuality. His rearticulation of touch references a broader notion of intimacy that is not determined by the sciences of sexuality. The essay's title, Loving on a Minefield, rejects the meanings ascribed to Black bodies pleasures and desires under occupation by the liberal capitalist state. He aims to quote, cast away the old paradigms and develop new ones that speak to choices based not in fear, but in love. This love is not the love conceptualized under Western colonial modernity, but an improvised and creatively imagined mode of bodily sensation that counters imperialist or colonial appropriation of bodies and pleasures. And here I'm signifying on L.H. Stalin's work. Stevens's reimagining of sex does not rely solely on cognition. He proposes an orientation towards sex that privileges, quote, what we think and feel, or what works for us in our own realities and lives. His personal litany, do not fear the touch of your brother, it might be his touch that saves you, reconfigures touch as a site of embodied knowledge and sensuality outside the state fiction mind of Black queer sexuality. In his contribution to the volume, A Soul Retrieval, the late Vincent Woodard, a Black queer scholar and the award-winning author of the posthumously published study, The Delectable Negro, Human Consumption and Homoeroticism in U.S. Slave Culture, recounts the story of his deceased uncle, whom he describes as, quote, healer man, woman inside, old cinnamon colored gal. While alive, Woodard's uncle, quote, walked the streets selling pussy, laughing loud down somebody's back alley door. After his uncle's death from AIDS, Woodard recounts a time when he was outside taking a break from rehearsing for a play when, quote, something hit him in his stomach, bit him, tore some teeth through. Something knocked him against a concrete building. Woodard surmises that it was his uncle's spirit that attacked him, 
This encounter provides the backdrop for the essay central question. Quote, where does the spirit journey when it, when it lifts from a body written down from AIDS? Woodard describes his uncle as a healer who worked with children with disabilities. They could ease the pains of bodies, minds, and hearts, and they were good with menstrual cramps and complicated blood flow. He believes his uncle's healing powers came from a female spirit within, which he likens to his great-great-grandmother, Mandy Ned, described as, quote, midwife, shotgun carrying Cherokee woman in the back pine woods of East Texas. It is the female spirit within that compels Woodard's uncle to dress up and go out every night and quote, curse and drink and pick up strange men, after which they would wake up not remembering where they had been or how they got home. Woodard refutes the community narratives of the spirit woman as evil, demonic, nasty, and slutty, claiming that quote, anything beautiful and shining will turn vicious and thorny after so much abuse. He condemns the social, political, and religious forces that bruised his uncle's soul. Woodard's emphasis on spirit, rooted in female, Black, and Cherokee cultures and cosmologies, brings to mind Elliot Stallings' reconceptualization of transworld identity. Transworld identity, or identity across possible worlds, reconfigures transgender identity as more metaphysical than social, and quote, consistently provides a new worldview when the old one is attacked or colonized. Discussing the ongoing disparagement, the disparagement of his uncle by family and community members, even after his death from AIDS, Woodard writes, quote, and so what if the bitch possessed, and, and dressed, possessed him and dressed herself and darkened her lips and fucked until the sun shone a new color? This problem was not the spirit, but the context and complex political religious forces that impinged upon my uncle's body and soul. Woodard homes in on his uncle, uncle's embattled spirit to illustrate how HIV, AIDS, immunodeficiency, meds, cocktails do not describe the quote, labor and suffering of the soul. Noting the soul fatigue he's seen in so many of his friends who have died of AIDS, he expands AIDS prevention and treatment to include the elimination of the colonial, racist, sexist, transphobic, and AIDS-phobic forces that got undergird our current world human organization. Forces that usher Black, queer, and trans bodies into this world already, quote, shackled down with difference and memory. Because trans world identities consistently provide a new worldview, Woodard proposes an alternative approach to the traumatic losses accrued from HIV and AIDS. On the morning after he steals his uncle's ashes back from his aunt, fulfilling his uncle's wishes to be buried on the ancestral land, Woodard asserts, quote, it is incumbent upon us to reimagine this tragedy, the Holocaust that has culminated around HIV and AIDS. The culprits are too numerous to name. So rather than blame, I believe that it is more useful to spend our time uncovering sources of healing and power. For Woodard, the primary sacred task and the road to liberation is, quote, relearning how to love and care for our individual selves, our souls. Woodard's emphasis on love and care directs us back to Stevens's vision of love as a force that might counter imperialist and colonial appropriation of bodies and cultures. Woodard extends Stevens's insight in his view of the sacred as a vantage point for reimagining our current orders of knowledge and sensing otherwise modes of human and otherly human being. The use of Black queer literature as a tool of HIV AIDS prevention reminds us that these anthologies consist of imaginative forms that do not reflect the reality of the contributors or the groups they represent. As such, they challenge accepted languages of social service and bureaucracies usually rendered in objective language. Stevens and Woodard's essays dispute the knowledge produced by the Young Men's Study in particular, its attempt to measure Black queer alterity against dominant conceptions of human sexuality. 
through the subjective and creative aspects of the personal essay form, these Black queer intellectuals confront traditional research paradigms that conflate Black sexual difference with sexual deviance and claim to know the truth about Black queer life and sex. Thank you. It's a lot of it. Yeah, that's, that's a very rich and comprehensive uh, presentation and really interesting to understand the conversation going and start it. Um, maybe I can ask Ito and Ali to uh, come back on screen if possible. Um, we have about a half an hour left. Um, and so, um, I mean, I have questions, obviously, but I, I think before we like, actually start the conversation and have the audience uh, participate as well, perhaps I, I want to ask if any of you have questions or comments or remarks for each other. Um, after listening to all hearing um, each other's presentations. Not none. <laughs> um, I just thought, I mean, I, 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 I can start the, you know, I can start the conversation off. Um, something, something that I've been thinking about as I said, listening to all of your presentations was a question of um, pleasure and a question of agency. And I was wondering if each of you could talk a bit about that, you know, how, how you understand pleasure and agency in respect to each of your respective work or the kinds of comments and remarks that you make in your respective uh, presentations. Hi. Hi, Martin. Hi. Um, thanks so much everyone for all of the thoughts and research you shared in your work. I'm so excited to be in conversation here. Um, Darius, you were just speaking about um, the anthology as a way to shift the focus from the individual to the state, instead of like pointing to the pathologies of like sex to think about like literature and art and collaboration as a way to like destigmatize viral transmission away from the individual to look at systems. And I think that's been the most interesting parallel to me this whole time as someone who has researched and worked in HIV to think about like, there's this moment in COVID where suddenly the individual is the site of intervention. Like even in the way we're thinking about like how individuals are being blamed or not for viral transmission in a way that like with HIV, we already established that we want to do that reversal. And so I guess what I'm interested in thinking about pleasure and individual pleasure is how do we use our pleasure and use collaboration in like the way that Joseph Beam envisioned it? Like, how do we like come together and, and use sex and desire to, to shift this focus away from the individual? So I guess I'm not really answering that question, but I'm trying to like do that, like with Tally, for example, and Morgan in the way that we're working together. Yeah, I mean, you know, part of my interest in, in thinking about the sacred is, is about sort of, you know, in Jackie Alexander's thinking about it, um, neither being individuated or secularized, right? And in, in terms of thinking about the conception of self. Um, and that sort of creates a, a different kind of thinking about sort of pandemics, right? Um, but at the same time, right, you know, I'm also thinking about that in contrast to the work and, you know, this has been a part of the conversation today of someone like Marlon Bailey, who's asking us to sort of rethink um, uh, sort of public health interventions that always assume that, you know, Black gay men are, you know, are trying to resist at all costs, um, not becoming positive and right and sometimes sort of pleasure and connection and intimacy is what they're seeking and becomes more important um, than this sort of um, 
the, the choice to try to be um, to avoid um, infection. I don't, you know, part of the sort of conundrum or problem for me is that I don't know how to think about that in this moment, right? Where so much of what is happening, right, has been framed as either, at least in the US context, um, as like a not getting vaccinated, is, is about liberal um, rights, freedoms, right? Um, at the same time, that means that so much of um, the, the ways that we think about transmission are framed through these kind of political ideologies. And so that the idea of sort of trying to apply what Bailey is thinking to the sort of contemporary moment, I don't know if it holds because so much of you know, what's at stake now is that even those kind of individualized choices um, have an impact on the whole, right? And on the globe. So I'm, you know, I'm at this space where I don't, you know, know how to sort of um, think it except for the ways that folks are trying to imagine pleasure and intimacy outside of um, ways that can potentially um, sort of impose or uh, risk on other folks who are not, right, um, uh, making those kinds of choices. So I, that's why, I mean, I'm sort of in a state of confusion. And, and so, and that's why I sort of end up landing at this place of like, you know, we need a new worldview, right? Um, we need a different sort of human organization because the way that we're sort of conceptualizing this thing right now is, is really, you know, kind of fucked um, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's, 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 I mentioned this uh, last panel about how, you know, um, I, and I, I've mentioned this throughout the series about how, uh, you know, comparisons between HIV AIDS and this kind of present moment only go so far. I mean, it, 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 it can't make that stretch. And right. I, Right. Well, they're careful about the kinds of comparisons that they make. I think right. there's lots of lessons that we can um, learn from the, the, the AIDS crisis, but I, I, I'm always cautious about what those comparisons and what those lessons can do for this present moment. But on top of that, I think, you know, following up on what you said, Darius, I think. You know, we are only, I feel personally, that we are only at the very beginning or early stages of a very, very new world as mm -hmm. a pandemic. Like this is a, there is a shift on a, on a global level that I, I think we are not really going to be fully aware of its implications or repercussions for a long time to come. Um, that being said, at a more personal or subjective or intimate level, you know, these shifts are not always felt. In right. The, right? It, 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 you know, for many people, life did not change as a result of this pandemic. You know, they still had to wake up each morning and go to work and navigate the world under different circumstances, but what they were asked to do or what they were expected to do was businesses of always. And I in you know, it's important. It's a question that I was asking about agency. Is I mean, as as an it, it's experienced so differently by different people, um, and it's, it's pleasure or what it, that means is also experienced so differently for different people, and you know, it, it's yet to be seen what the innate sense of in the aftermath of this pandemic, if there is an aftermath. There is, mm -hmm. there is an after, this is, this is a new world order. 
and as such, there is a new world view or a set a new set of world views have to be have to emerge as a result of this pandemic. I feel. But it's also old world views being imposed on the way that we think about this pandemic. And that to me is where I get stuck, right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The, 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 I mean, the old world views are definitely very much a part of how, how uh, bodies are surreal. Right. Um, you know, how, who, around who, who who has to bear a blunt of what's happening right now, right? Right. Um, if there are any questions from our audience, I'm not about to um, invite, I invite people from the audience to ask questions. If not, we can carry on with the conversation. Um, All at Um, uh, you can put your questions either in the Q&A or in the chat, whichever works best for you. And I apologize for, again, for how washed out I am. <laughs> we can't seem to fix it. <laughs> but. If uh, in you know as a question uh, that's I felt perhaps uh, um, a bit more about sort of you know, the reason that um, surveillance operates at this moment, um, and I, I was wondering if. It, if, if you or Ill or Darius uh, or not, talk a bit more about how, you know, you know for example, in, in, in Mountain and Alley's presentation, um, you know, a lot of those that, ways in which that you, you presented your, your work was, a, was about how, you know, different people on these apps are watching each other and surveilling each other and kind of observing how uh, one exists on social media. And I was wondering if each of you could talk a bit more about um, surveillance, more broadly, but also specifically in relation to um, sort of this moment. Um, mm. I think that's a really great question. And, and for me, like the whole paradigm is if we learn from HIV and HIV activism that it was both like untenable and also like a project to resist, to blame the individual for the spread of illness. Um, it's an interesting leap to what Darius, you were saying about how we need to sort of use like literature, art, culture, and the personal narrative to refute that. Like to actually show the way the individual is not like a vessel of contagion, we need to actually look at the individual and how that like with aid, like AIDS activism was about media 
like using handheld video technology for the first time to like go into people's homes who were living with HIV and say, you know, this is what it, domestic space is for like people who are living with the virus and like what it's like to, to bring the camera in. And so I think what I was trying to do in the collaboration is to say like, what would it look like to have a grinder experience that isn't about individuals? That's about my personal narrative transposed through two of my friends about like the different systems that we face and like trying to understand our individual selves in a way that isn't about pointing the finger or blaming other people for like creating a toxic masculinity culture, but to look at the systems that shape like how we interface with the platform and how we understand masculinity and how I understand my own masculinity through all the systems that we're facing. But what I, the end to which I wanna do that is still the same project about like, how do I use a personal narrative that's also like about community to, to start like applying what we learned from HIV to COVID. Like, yeah, it's new, but like at the time of like the initial AIDS crisis, like everyone's like, this is totally new, nothing applies. Like blame individual host <laughs> quarantine. And, and people were like, oh, like we need to not see this as a new virus, like in every pandemic ever you know, the fear of contagion has always been a way to blame the individual and then have racism, racial segregation and, and policing and increased surveillance, et cetera. Like this whole war metaphor thing was taken up by AIDS activists to say like, you know, and to think about the disability framework of what does it mean to see our own bodies and our own viral inner lives as being like threatening in, a, in a, like a borders way. And, and I really am interested in like how you're both and also you, Ricky, like how three of you are um, thinking about your personal approach to like, how to like critique the technology and the narratives through which we're being told to like militarize and personalize and individualize the choices that we're given when really like we need to turn around and say like, where is the state responsible for like the lack of medical access right now? But I mean, I don't know, like I was thinking about that sort of gaze over COVID um, was the sort of campaign that was sort of using shaming um, as an approach, particularly for gay communities um, uh, who were, you know, thought to be spreading COVID. And I remember the, them going to, uh, when, when they were in Puerto Vallarta, right? Um, and sort of people were calling attention to them being there and partying with abandon. And, you know, there were some AIDS activists who jumped on and were like, well, you know, this is a part of shaming culture. I mean, as, you know, but it's problematic because like groups like ACT UP did use shaming, right? For politicians who were denying, um, you know, the, or sort of ignoring um, what was happening. Um, but at the same time, as we want to sort of think about um, the possibility of having promiscuity in a pandemic. Um, the other piece of that was that, you know, the hospitals in, in Puerto Vallarta were full, right? And that people who were essential workers, you know, working in tourism there were exposed by these folks coming in. And so, you know, we also have to think about scale that's not operating just at the level of the individual. I mean, this is why it's like, those things don't necessarily map on to the sort of contemporary moment. moment. Um, and, you know, only in the sense of the sort of mapping on is that they are sort of pandemics that run along the lines of uh, social inequality, right? Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm, I want to find a way to sort of think about um, sort of pandemics or contagion outside of the individual, but in this moment, um, it's, you know, it's quite complicated, right? Um, and I can't say that I'm arriving at that same kind of conclusion um, right now, um, but given the way that, you know, that sort of the, the liberal individual and uh, sort of narrative it has been, or it's revealed the way that they have been, you know, it's masking whiteness and masking sort of global Northern um, power, right? And imperialism. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't know um, sort of where um, or how to think about it um, in this moment, but to say that in the same way that there are some parallels in the same way that people are, you know, trying to frame um, what's happening with the breakout in Provincetown where they tried to sort of spin a narrative that gay people know about this from AIDS and they were open to public health officials about talking about what was going on. Um, I'm not necessarily sure um, 
if that is, you know, wholly the case, right? Um, Thanks. I think, Ricky, the, the piece I'd add just around um, surveillance is obviously with increased modernization also comes um, different kinds of different kinds of tools and mechanisms um, that create the impact of surveillance differently or bring certain people again closer to being surveilled, for example, like folks who um, already have different kinds of connections with systems. I think we have to also think about things like the increase of artificial intelligence, um, the link between things like general health data and access to health data in relation to how we're, moder how we're monitoring um, wellness more generally, but then how that's getting compounded again here, like things like the vaccine passports, et cetera. Um, and even just simple things like having to scan when you're going to restaurants and um, the information that you give at that point. And just, I, so in terms of surveillance, I think modernization creates different kinds of interconnections, obviously, as well as better kinds of surveillance. And again, the impact of what that is for particular groups, I think other, others have said that, but also how uh, precarity will bring folks closer to um, surveillance. And um, obviously I think um, there's much like a, a much larger investment in like biohealth data as well um, in, in ways that are, are different um, in, in this time. So I think those are things that also have to be taken very seriously and um, thought through in the context of how, um, you know, how, how we begin to think about even what we know about this moment. Right, like, um, and the importance of remem remembering some of the really mundane things that, again, like that scan at that restaurant, right? Um, and I think we're we're not thinking about what that means for privacy, security, health, access, etc. Okay, should I read the question that we have from the audience at this point? Yeah. Okay. So we have a question that says from Katie Girl, uh, hi Darius and Adil. I'm wondering if you could both speak to how creative work and personal essays, the work Darius pointed to, intervenes in public health and public policy. What other worlds and practices does such work imagine and enact? And what do you understand as the limitations of looking to such cultural work? In addition to the work Darius pointed to, are there other artists, poets, poets, musicians, artists, whose work you find useful to think about these interventions? I'm gonna to try to look at the question as, as well. Um, So I think, um, sorry, Darius, were you gonna go ahead? Oh, no, go ahead, please. I think a really great example um, is the presentation today um, that, that was given in terms of both how personal narrative, how querying and cripping um, can really respond to and create um, not just, you know, in terms of sh showing us what that looks like, but also how living and being together um, in ways that are different, create um, connected livabilities. And that I, is, is what I saw that in this um, particular example, that it was both personal narrative, but also interpersonal and you know, interconnected narratives. And how we now obviously just through that experience have come to understand the impact of um, the pandemic on you know, a community of people and you know, a set of individuals um, but also it's just, it asked me to conceptualize, you know, again, that interaction is very different from it being a person, you know, an independent relationship and things like that. Um, I think, you know, creative work and obviously personal essays are, are critical in providing interventions because I think that those are often, um, hearing directly from the people who are living what that experience is and, um, I think again about how, um, you know, mad, disabled, queer, 
um, crip people live and have lived in ways that have been communal, in ways that have been already about caring about each other, um, thinking about how to ensure that people get something to eat or get their groceries, um, not because people are stealing all the toilet paper from the shelves, but because that is a day-to-day -day kind of lived practice and a care practice. Um, and so I think a part of it as well is, you know, personal narrative and personal essay um, in this case, like I, I also just think about witnessing what that is um, and what we can learn from that in very real ways and how I see that as a direct challenge to both neoliberalism, the individual kind of experience, a challenge to intimacy, a challenge to um, refusals of care and love and sort of an opportunity to remove people, like re remove ourselves from a kind of um, state state only dependency and bring us back into um, community. Um, oh, in terms of artists work. Um, so I think one of the things that comes to mind uh, really quickly is the work of Abdi Osman, who I thoroughly enjoyed during the um, COVID time. He has a series called um, The COVID Drawings, which I think um, I'd invite folks to look at. Um, generally, above and beyond that, I think his um, artwork has been very meaningful and impactful for me during this time. Um, you know, poets, there's so many. Obviously, Kuguru, I also think that your work is really important as well, so I don't want to act like I don't know you through the Zoom room. Um, <laughs> you know, like I think, yeah, I think of the work of Kinesia Lubrin, I think of the work of Dion Brand, I think of the work of um, Amber K. Williams, I think of the work of Ronaldo Walcott, I think of the work um, of Mustafa the Poet, um, you know, I think of the work of Muhammad Ali, um, you know, there are just so many people that I think of my colleagues here um, that, are, that are in conversation with me. Um, I think about the the threads of people that I don't know on Twitter that that create a kind of you know um, liberty that I I I, I don't know, um, and again all those works are really important and, and interesting, um, but I also you know equally think about just the day to day struggles of the individuals that um, we don't necessarily see their their stories. Um, so I also just think about the labor of the people who've kept us you know going on a on a on a daily basis so i don't know if that answers the question but i can add i guess um you know one of the benefits that i you know see about um with uh sort of with turning to literature and culture is in certain ways of you know it op you know it's a in it operates through a kind of poetics of opacity. Um, it's, you know, it sort of um, rejects kinds of universalisms and universal narratives and understandings of how um, disease um, is uh, sort of operates in people's lives. And, you know, it also sort of directs attention away from sort of uh, normative institutions that seek to treat the disease and not the person. Um, and, but yet at the same time, right, um, you know, public health for a while has gotten hip to thinking about sort of structural inequities and in certain ways it becomes a, a sort of a mode for them to sort of perfect, perfect their surveillance technologies in terms of thinking about how intersectionality then gets sort of morphed into a kind of um, multiple vectors of disease, right? Um, and so in that, you know, there are limitations but, um, and, uh, and also the sort of limitations in a, a kind of poetics of opacity is that these mainstream organizations that do have the money um, continue to refuse, right, to look at these um, narratives and sort of modes of cultural production as legitimate forms of knowledge production and ways to sort of transform. And so to me, that's still not a failure of these texts. It's a failure of these mainstream institutions to transform. Um, I would say that, you know, I've been looking at lately um, the work of uh, Kia Labeja, both um, as a sort of ballroom house mother, but also as a photographer and video artist. Um, and dancers of sort of multi-genre um, work um, in the same way as, you know, thinking about these multi-genre anthologies that have been taken up since the, you know, uh, AIDS appeared in the United States. 
um, as well as I've you know really been paying attention to the work that's happening at Visual Aids and I've been working on um, sort of tourmaline's short video um, precisely because it um, it sort of it, it doesn't separate out HIV but um, and it thinks about it within sort of larger issues around housing, right? And even sort of metaphysical sort of issues around like chronic homelessness for black folks, right? And in the Americas, right? And so, um, yeah, those are, you know, some examples of, of folks that I'm looking to right now to think about AIDS um, in a different way. Um, uh, the, uh, actually, at the end of the event, uh, uh, I just want to take this opportunity. It's been a lot of the questions or uh, comments or remarks. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for coming out. Uh, I want to thank the audience for coming out this afternoon and, and watching us uh, and participating. And I also want to thank the speakers, uh, Ito, Darius, Moti, Gary, Morton. Um, this was a very, very uh, compelling and thought-provoking kind of panel. Um, there will be a recording of the event available on the website in the next couple of days, hopefully. Uh, and the final panel for the series is on Friday, October 15th. I hope you it. Um, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues at the School of Disability Studies for their ongoing support of the series and for the tech support. And I want to also, and Angie Lang for the post caption and for fan for the light event. Um, yeah, uh, I hope um, that you all you have a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks for coming out. So, thank you. Thank you.